be here. Um, my name is Owen. I'm one of the pastors. And I'd just like to welcome you to our time of worship. And before we enter into our time of worship, I want to remind you that our children's ministry is hard at work getting ready for VBS, Virtual Bible School. That's going to be blasting off June 8th through 12th. You don't want to miss that. You can sign up online. It's going to be a great virtual event for our kids. And you can see more information about that on our webpage. You know, we're a community that celebrates all that God is doing in our lives. And today we have an opportunity to see a short video of some testimony of some folks in our church who are going to share about their thankfulness and how God has been faithful to them. So we're going to take a moment just to see these snapshots of God's faithfulness to some folks in our community as we prepare our hearts for worship. Let's look to the Lord as we watch this short video. Hey CBC, it is so wonderful to worship with y'all this morning. Um, I think one way that I've seen God's faithfulness in my life is through a recent conversation I had with a friend of mine who was dead set on sending a nasty worded email to her boss who had just laid her off. And as we were talking, I remember thinking, wow, I'm so tired. <laughs> it would just be so much easier if I said, do whatever you want, I don't care. And I mean, it was as if I was immediately transported back to the pit that my life was before God stepped in and saved me. And I was just overwhelmed with thankfulness that that was not God's response to me. God didn't say to me, you know, it would just be easier to not love you. It would be easier to just say, do whatever you want. I don't care. God's faithfulness to me looked a lot like stepping into my mess and redeeming me. And I think we have such a unique opportunity in all this COVID craziness to not only step into our friends and family's messes, but to also do the hard work of showing God's faithfulness to them. I'm Linda Lloyd, and my life has changed so much the last two months. Like everyone else, COVID-19 has demanded a life of quarantine. The shutdown of businesses has dramatically affected my husband's employer. How I do my job here at church changes daily. Loved ones have lost their jobs. My brother-in-law's cancer suddenly returned and he and my sister came to St. Louis to live with us for treatment. The list goes on and on. It's hard. Everything's out of my control. However, I'm not letting anxiety and fear rule my life because the most important thing in my life is not changing. I remind myself daily that God's love for me has not changed. God's plan for me has not changed. God's grace and mercy for me has not changed. God's not surprised by what's going on in the world or in my life. He is faithful and unchanging. Because of this and only this, I'm finding peace and hope and much joy in the small, sweet moments together I'm having with my family, even with so much stress and sadness surrounding us. My comfort is in Him. He has me on my knees, and that's where I need to be. Good morning, we're Ken and Beth. And as we are here sheltering in place, um, we're reminded of God's faithfulness to us as we live simpler, simpler lives. Um, he has been faithful to uh, love us and care for us and remind us that we're not in control, that He is leading us and caring for us every day. Um, I am grateful for the simple gifts He gives us of family and friends and our daily bread. And I see God's faithfulness every day in creation. He created the laws of nature, the changing seasons, the spring flowers and the birds songs and the frogs this could be the middle of winter and it's not and i'm thankful to him that it's spring Teach me some melodious song, 
sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, Mount of God's redeeming Welcome. It is a privilege this morning to gather together, even from a distance, to to worship the Lord. Uh, one of the uh, one of the difficult things about worshiping is it means recognizing that we are finite. Yeah, and in this season that we've been experiencing in the last uh, last two months, uh, I I have been confronted by many moments where my um, a lack of competence or my finiteness has uh, been brought to my attention. Uh, sometimes in the way that I uh, lack self-control or patience, uh, other times in just being pushed beyond what um, technology is capable of, of handling or what internet connections are capable of doing. But uh, maybe in the season you've been experiencing times of uh, just being reminded that you are not able to do all things. One of the great things about coming together and worshiping the Lord, uh, even though we're not physically together in this moment, is that we recognize that while we are finite, he is infinite. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 90, verses 1 through 2, and it really reminds us of just how infinite God is. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Not only is God infinite, but he has made himself our dwelling place. He has not lorded that over us, but he has invited us to be with him. So we invite you to come together with us uh, from your homes right now and worship the Lord as we do this together. Arise, my soul, arise, shake off your guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice on my behalf appears. Before the throne, my surety stands. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. Arise, arise. Arise, arise, my soul, arise, 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 my soul, arise, shake up your guilty fears and rise. The ever lives and plead for me to intercede, his all redeeming love, his precious blood to bleed. 
His blood atoned for every race. His blood atoned for every race. He sprinkles now the throne of grace. No rise, no rise, no rise, no rise, my soul. No rise, no rise, no rise. Arise, arise, my soul, arise Shake off your guilty fears and rise By bleeding wounds he bears Received on Calvary They pour effectual prayers They strongly plead for me Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry Ransom sinner died. Arise, 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 my soul, arise, 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 my soul, arise, shake off your guilty fears and rise. No rise, no rise, no rise, no rise, my soul, no rise, no rise, no rise, no rise, no rise, my soul, no rise, shake off your guilty fears and rise.
we just sang the words, without thy sweet mercy, I could not live here. Sin would reduce me to utter despair. As we uh, prepare to confess our, our sins before God, it's worth asking that question. Uh, does your sin bring you to utter despair? Now, the other day, uh, my wife and I were on Netflix, and we watched a little bit of a, a Jerry Seinfeld comedy act. And uh, one, of the, one of the brilliances of Jerry Seinfeld is that he pulls out everyday things and shows how bizarre or out of place they might seem. There was a whole bit about the Pop-Tart. And I think the, the, the catchphrase he had was, it never goes bad because it never was fresh. And as a fan of the Pop-Tart, I, uh, I struggle with that a little bit. Uh, but it made me think about my, my own life. I didn't think about it in that moment. But later on, as I thought about that, and I, I considered how easy it is for sin to, to seem commonplace, for me to become comfortable with the things I do, and maybe I, I justify them. Well, they're not as bad as this, or other people do that, or, or I, I needed in this moment to do that, and, and I won't do it all the time. And how not only do I do that to myself, but, but Satan desires to divert my attention away from my sin, reducing me to utter despair. Because when I rationalize, when I become comfortable with it, uh, it becomes just, a, just okay. Maybe not great, but it's okay. And what, what our confession this morning from Psalm 31 reminds us of is that sin in any shape or form in our lives should never feel commonplace, should never feel okay, should never be tolerated. We always must be seeing more and more our sin is what is destroying us. Our sin is contrary to the way we were made to be. Our sin divides us from God, separates us from God. So I'm going to read this this morning and give you a moment to um, maybe just consider uh, the ways that God is calling you to recognize your sin and that part of that is allowing it to reduce us to utter despair so that in that we see our need for God. Psalm 31, verses 9 through 10, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. I take a moment now to confess your sins to the Lord. I'm not sure what, uh, what it's like in your household right now, but I know uh, in the past couple of weeks in my household, that is not a moment of silent confession. In fact, sometimes it's uh, moments of continued commission of sin. Uh, lots of noise, lots of chaos. And I think for me, one of the most difficult things about spending a quiet moment or any moment contemplating my sin is I start to feel the utter despair of sin that we sang about. I start to feel what the psalmist said. My strength fails because of my sin, my iniquity, and my bones waste away because I realize that I am not strong enough to handle this. I might make lists throughout the week of all the things that I can accomplish and, and conquer, and if I really spend a moment to contemplate the sin in my life, the struggles in my life, I start to feel hopeless because I can't, I can't fix this. I can't conquer this myself as much as I may want to and as much as I may think I can. But the awesome thing about God is that when sin reduces us to utter despair, we can cry out to him because he has taken it upon himself, knowing that we are finite, knowing that he is infinite, knowing that we are lost and dead in our sins. He did everything to take that from us. So our assurance comes from John, 1 John 1, verses 1 and 2. My little children, I am writing you these things to you, so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. 
What an amazing thing it is that we have a heavenly father who sees us and even when we wander away, calls to us as children, brings us to himself, and now we receive the righteousness of his son sent to live and to die and to rise again, to conquer what we could not conquer on our behalf. Uh, So with that in mind, let's sing of the great grace, the great grace that we have from our Lord Jesus Christ. grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon With infinite loss, grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Younger than every yesterday. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon. Amen. Well, before Hugh comes and shares the message this morning, we want to take a moment to recognize and celebrate our graduates. Uh, Each year around this time, we take a moment to celebrate all of our graduates and our church family. And this past week or so, there's been many special, special times of online and drive-by celebrations for many graduates. In fact, even our preschool had a car graduation parade, which was a lot of fun. Our high school ministry crew celebrated those graduating high school and were able to watch online special service graduation for Covenant Seminary. And there are others that graduated from college, from graduate school, and so many other schools. And we just want to recognize them and celebrate them this morning. So if you've graduated from preschool, all the way up to graduate school, wherever, we want you to stand and we're going to clap for you. Yes, that's right. You have to stand right now. So go ahead and stand up and we're going to clap for you. Way to go. Yeah. All right. We're glad, and we're glad the way that the Lord has worked to bring you to this point, and we want to pray for you. So let's uh, pray together and celebrate our graduates. Lord, thank you that we can celebrate our graduates today. Thank you for their hard work, their dedication, their perseverance, that you enabled them to get to this point. We know, Lord, that this is just another page in the story that you are knitting together for each of our graduates 
And we pray, Lord, that you would guide their next steps. Lord, we celebrate them and thank you for their families. Thank you for this beautiful milestone and pray for them as they transition to many different places in many different, in many different ways. Lord, may you continue to give them strength and guide each one. May they use their gifts to build your kingdom. And we ask this all for your glory and your name. Amen. Thanks, Owen. Good morning. And this is at CPC. This is our graduation Sunday. And we, every year at this time, we really have quite a celebration with all the different ages and stages, people making transitions. And of course, it is a different kind of year. But we add to this is a transition coming in our culture. And I want to pause here for a moment and and just share a couple announcements that are a significant part of our church life. The first one is that our St. Louis County is saying that in May 18th, businesses and various uh, meetings and gatherings will open up and in a limited way. So as a church, we're going to be reopening on May 31st. We're going to move into that period where we reopen. Now, it's going to be done in a limited way. And maybe I just want to pause and tell you a little bit about the philosophy we have here that we at CPC want to be ministering in the gospel with four basic ideas. First of all, faithful to our vision. We're living for Christ so that others might live. This is an urgent time of need for all of us. We have needs all the time, but there's a desperate sense of loneliness and despair creeping into our culture. CPC lives in Christ. We live for Christ, and we recognize the need we have, the need we have to share that ministry. Our ministry needs to continue. We want to be faithful. We want to be wise. We're going to be opening May 31st with a limited kind of opening. It'll be limited by numbers. We'll be practicing social distancing. We'll be doing a number of things to keep everybody safe. And that's just wise in our time together. Uh, We want to also be creative. We're not only going to meet on Sunday morning. There will be other gatherings that we have, perhaps some outside, perhaps other venues and parts. But we want to be a church that's creatively serving you in the next months And you'll be hearing more information about that. We'll always be coming to you virtually. I mean, if you want and feel that you need to stay home, we're going to be here with you. But then the final thing is not only faithful, wise, creative, but also flexible. The realities can change. And we want to be evaluating and adapting to those changing realities, no matter what direction they take us. So that's just something to keep in mind. May 31st, we'll see some of you here. We won't be able to have everybody, but then we'll eventually, whether through multiple services or through other venues, find a way to be together for the community of CPC. Second thing I want to update you on something, our COVID relief fund has been an extraordinary outpouring of generosity. We have received from CPC, from our CPC family, over $60,000 in COVID relief fund. And some of that money has already begun to go out. And so we're thankful for that. But because you've been so generous, we're going to ask you to pause for a moment now and uh, hold back from the giving to that fund for a while. As the next months unfold, we'll be giving to those in need. But we're so thankful for those who've already received funds and help in this time of need. And uh, we're thankful for the generosity, the way you poured out your gifts to the Lord. So we're going to look at Galatians today, Galatians chapter 6. And we've been overcoming fear and boredom and irritation and a number of realities that we face. But today we're going to overcome and think about how God can help us to overcome discouragement. Discouragement. And I have a special every May 17th, every graduation Sunday, there's a moment where we we stop. And and in one sense, I tailor this message to you, graduates. And I want to pause and say, of course, this is a tough time. There's a sense of discouragement. You're Deciding to go off to college, is that going to happen in the same way you thought it would? Those graduated from graduate school or college, have you been able to find a job? It can be discouraging looking around and looking about and, and figuring all that out. There are numbers of times in our lives where we feel discouraged. And I have reflected a lot in these last weeks about discouragement, how we try certain things. Some of us are technically discouraged right now, aren't we? We're trying to get on to the internet. We're trying to upgrade our computers. We're trying to learn how to do Zoom. We're trying to learn how to do FaceTime. And it's discouraging because sometimes it works. Sometimes we don't know how it works. We're learning and adapting. It's frustrating and we can want to give up. Other times it's, it's more basic issues. The issues within our hearts. 
the loneliness and the personal challenges we have, those just seem to multiply the more time we spend alone with ourselves. So I want to encourage you today. And maybe the first encouragement I give you comes from one of the most famous people. Winston Churchill was in 1940. He was visiting a small school. It was called the Harrow School. And he was honored that day. Now, 1940, Britain was a time of real distress. The bombings of Germany had begun. The people of God were under what they called the Blitz. The people, when they heard the sirens, would have to run to the subway. They'd have to run to places of shelter. And they would huddle down in masses, and the bombs would fall, and then the all-clear sign, they would come back. And it would happen again and again and again. And the Air Force was fighting off the Luftwaffe, and they were finding some battles, some victories, but there was the uncertainty and the frustration of how long would this go on. Winston Churchill gave one of his most famous speeches to a, a group of students. So graduates, members of our church, those who are here today, listen to his words. He says, we don't know what's going to happen. There seems to be a wave that has come and maybe another is coming. There those who have imaginations that can make things out to be worse or maybe what they'll be. But my words to you, he said, are this. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in. Except to the convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. What a powerful description of overcoming discouragement, of being so encouraged that you dig in and you continue to do the things we would say that God calls us to do. Well, this kind of commitment, this kind of courage is found in this passage in Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to read it for you here today. Let's look at it. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the, from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season... In due season, we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have this opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that as we look at this issue of discouragement, that we would recognize that the Bible teaches on it. God speaks to us about it because it's a reality of all our lives. There is such a temptation to give in, to give up, to go our own way, to walk in this path of courage and commitment in the midst of so little results or so little opportunity seems to be futile. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us the kind of courage, the kind of encouragement that we would live, not in our own strength, but in the power of in the strength of the Holy Spirit, whom you have given us. And so we thank you for this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's probably one of my favorite shows, um, long, many years, but even more recently, Bear Grylls, when he goes outside and he attacks the outdoors. Bear Grylls is from England and actually has a, a real commitment to Christ. He was a ranger kind of soldier, who went all about the world serving in the military for England, but then now is doing all kinds of outdoor adventure. And so he oftentimes in this new show, Bear Grylls will take celebrities out into the wilderness. He teaches them how to live off the land for 24 hours. He challenges them to jump out of a helicopter with a parachute or to do something that's terrifying. Oftentimes there's some kind of eating of outdoor stuff that you would never eat in your normal life. But one of the challenges that almost always comes is the repelling or the climbing. Some kind of place where they're in the wilderness where he takes various celebrities out of their comfort zone into a place of climbing. And as he does that, he oftentimes fixes a rope and ties people up and begins to help them down the mountain. But one of the things when they're going up especially or down that he says to them as they're clinging to the mountains 
is that they have to realize that as they're holding fast with their hands and digging in, that he'll remind them again and again and again of two things. The first thing he reminds them of is, trust me, I've got you. Trust me, you can lean on the rope. I've got you. Secondly, he says, your hands are not as strong as your legs. So it's more important that you dig in and find footholds than handholds. Your hands cannot hold you up the side of a mountain very long. You're going to run out of your own strength. And of course, so what this says to me, as I begin to think about this passage, and the passage is about growing weary and becoming discouraged, is that in order to deal with discouragement, we've got to seek the strength of the Lord. We're going to have to learn to trust in the lifeline that he has attached to us through Christ and the Holy Spirit. We've got to have that fundamental trust that allows us to rest in him. But we're also going to have to learn to climb this mountain with an understanding of where our strength and power comes from. It's not going to be in our plans and approaches that come from our own intuition. It's going to come from the footholds where we stand upon the solid truth and godly work of the Holy Spirit. That's what Galatians chapter 6 is trying to say. It's really saying to us, all of us who are discouraged, trust and try again in the Spirit's power. Do you see that in these verses? It talks about in verse 8, sowing to our own flesh, that we will oftentimes try to go our own way or do things in our own strength. But this passage reminds us that that we're to sow or invest or express the life of God, the life of God through us in the Spirit. We're to trust in God and try again in His Spirit's power. And so that's what this passage is driving at. It's interesting to note that discouragement is found throughout the whole of the Scripture. You go back to the Old Testament. Moses became discouraged leading the people of God. He became so discouraged, he became frustrated, he literally hit the rock with, with his staff in order to bring water out. And for that, he was disciplined by the Lord. We know Elijah, for instance. Elijah was the great prophet. Do you remember that? There in the prophet Elijah was fighting the prophets of Baal, and he, he was fighting against Ahab and Jezebel. And do you remember? He became discouraged. And it was surprising, actually, because he became discouraged after one of his greatest victories. The fire from heaven had fallen and destroyed and, and destroyed the prophets of Baal and showed Israel that showed Israel that they were indeed serving the one and true God. But what happened was Jezebel redoubled her threat. And so this, this is the element of discouragement, isn't it? Elijah left and went off and said, I'm done. I give up. I'm done. I give up. And so what did God do? Well, the pattern that we find here in Galatians is there in the Old Testament. God met him, fed him, spoke to him gently in a breeze, and then sustained him with a vision for the future. You see, God knows how to encourage us when we're discouraged. And as you're sitting at home today watching this video, what are the things that are discouraging you? Of course, the crisis that's in front of us, the various challenges it brings, the uncertainty. We want to just give up, give in. Let our attitude go to a place of negativity or bitterness. But there are other things that are more consistent, that are really apart from this virus. What are the things in your life that have always been discouraging? Trying to lose weight. Trying to learn something new. Trying to get along with those folks in your family, well, <laughs> that drive you crazy. Trying to see and get along with certain people, friends that are just very irritating. It's discouraging. Finding a job. Finding a job that really is meaningful. Finding something that really is profitable. Well, even for us, those of us who live in the church, who are part of Christ's calls to the mission of the world, we're, we can be frustrated with the work we're doing. The church isn't growing. New churches aren't being planted. Christianity seems to be on the, the retreat. We look around the world and we see injustice, poverty. We've worked at it, but it seems to be still prevalent. Those who are working for life, the forces of darkness and death are, are strong and still there. We think about the injustices of slavery or sexual slavery, still present. We've been working for years. We look around this world and we think, it's just not working. It's just not happening. 
And if you feel that element of discouragement in your life, this passage is for the Galatians and it's for you. It's saying we can trust Christ and his Holy Spirit and we can try again. We can try again. So how, how are you discouraged? In what ways? I wanted to unpack that for a moment. I think we're discouraged sometimes. In this passage, the verse 6 and 7 begins, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. We give up. We grow weary and we give up. We become discouraged and then we despair and then we stop doing the things we know to be true. Why? Because we feel they're of no they're really of no value. They don't work. I wrote down four things that I think discourage me when I try to control what we, I can't. I'm trying to control other people's responses. I'm trying to control the world and how it reacts. Well, that's always going to be discouraging. Sometimes it's discouraging because we don't see results. I listened to one uh, commentator who's a general describe what it meant to be in the military. And he said this, and it just struck me. He said, military operations are working in a resistant element. Sometimes a phrase just strikes me almost as humorous. Um, we're now, all of us, working in a resistant element. Everything we do is just a little more difficult, and that makes it discouraging. And then, most of all, when you find yourself all alone, when you find yourself all alone, or you feel all alone, there is where we're prone to be discouraged and begin to despair. So what do we do? What do we do when we're discouraged? This passage tells us very simply, when you're so discouraged, you should begin to sow, to sow, to plant your life in the Spirit. Do you see it there? It says, the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Verse 8 says, that is exactly what God intends for us. The one who sows to the Spirit. So what does that mean, to sow, to, to plant? Most of us aren't an agricultural kind of culture. We don't plant that, although right now we're planting a lot of things to keep ourselves busy, and as spring comes, we're planting things in our garden. So we know what it means to plant a seed or to plant a plant and look for results. And so it's that imagery. It's the imagery of, of planting without immediate results. You plant in the spring and you harvest in the fall in general terms. This is part of the experience of life. So what is Jesus saying here in this passage? He's saying, first of all, that the Spirit convicts us of giving up. Right now, there are areas of your life like mine that you've just given up. You've just been so discouraged by the lack of results. And the Holy Spirit is saying to us, hey, hey, you've got to keep trying. That's the first uncomfortable part about the Holy Spirit coming into our life. The Holy Spirit comes into our life as a gift, and he assures us of our relationship with Jesus. But one of the first things he does in our life, where at the beginning or in the middle of our life, is he convicts us. The image I use all the time on this is, is when your hands have been frozen. Literally, frostbite has taken over your hands, perhaps not to that extent, but you've all experienced when your hands are so, so, so cold. When you begin to warm up your hands, what happens? It hurts. It really hurts. It stopped hurting. It stopped hurting when your hands are cold, right? But when you begin to warm up your hands, you put them under cold water even, your hands burn. This is precisely what the Holy Spirit does in our life. The Holy Spirit convicts us of going our own way. It says, God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, he also will reap. There's always a moment of conviction and accountability that comes into our lives where we realize, I've given up. I've gone my own way. I've gone to the end of my strength. And that conviction can be a painful moment. And for some of us, it can be a moment where we simply want to give up. But that's actually the first step to moving forward. The first step to sowing in the Spirit is recognizing my way is not working. Right now, as graduates, as you head out into the world, one of the things that is difficult as you move to your first jobs, to maybe new locations, is things are unfamiliar, and your first attempts at things won't always go well. Those of us who've been, those of us who've been in the workforce, those of us who've been in life long enough know that's just part of life. But even for the new or the old, it's the reality that 
there's a temptation to give up. This passage is, in one sense, a bracing conviction that the Holy Spirit gives us that, you know what, things are not going to be easy. But in God, they can be good. But it begins with that painful recognition that where I am now is not where God wants me to be later. And so it begins with that conviction. There is a gap, and that gap can drive us to further despair. But remember, this is where we trust and try again. You see, when I become discouraged and depend upon myself, what God wants to do is convict me of my own dependence on myself. The first step is that I trust and try again. The image of climbing is I realize that God has secured me. He's tied his lifeline of Jesus, life, death, and resurrection about me. The Spirit has surrounded me and adopted me as a child of God. And so I have now the confidence that no matter where I am on this climb, no matter how slow I've been going, God loves me. He, he will never leave me. He'll sustain me as I move up this, up this challenging wall called life. The second thing we recognize here is that God sustains our weary hearts and hands. Do you see it here? In verse 8, it continues, The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Notice it says that our progress, our strength, will come from the Spirit. Ultimately, everything we've ever had, God created us, He redeemed us, but He guides us and gives us All the progress we make ultimately comes from God's hands. One of the great, great, great blessings of life is when we realize that God will give us the strength we need as we step out into the next challenge. Oh, I can tell you, new parents feel this all the time, don't you? You just don't know if you're going to be able to get up one more time when the baby's crying. You just don't know if you're going to be able to play one more game. One more game of Candyland. It's just more than any human being could bear. You just don't know if you can wait up and talk to that young adult about curfew. again. You're just worn out. The reality is the Holy Spirit meets us as we step into the next challenge. Meets us. The Holy Spirit will allow us, to, it says, to reap from Him. Well, this means we're not alone. And I began to reflect this week on some of the great missionaries who went out on their own. William Carey in the 1790s into the early 1800s went from England to India. And of course, this was a vast country with vast challenges. And as William Carey went into India, he faced, he faced the fact that for seven years, as he was a pastor and a preacher and a church planter, he never saw one convert. Seven years. Never had one person from that Indian culture say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. You can imagine the discouragement. In fact, he wrote these words. He said, I am in a strange land. I have no Christian friends, a large family, and nothing to supply their wants. He was discouraged. But listen to what he says. But I have God. And his word is sure. And so I, this is great, listen to this word. He said, so I plod. What a word, plod. It sounds exactly like what it is. One step, barely at a time. But as we sow and invest and align our life to the Holy Spirit and his purpose in Christ, we simply take that next difficult, exhausted step The promise we have here is that God will meet us in that next step and he will enable us to gain new strength and enable us to be encouraged to move on. He sustains our weary hearts and hands. And of course, we know the story of William Carey that indeed hundreds of folks in his lifetime and now thousands and perhaps in one day millions of people will come from the work that he did in that terribly discouraging time. We're so thankful that he was able to be by the Holy Spirit sustained. Where are you struggling? Where do you need that power of God? The weariness you feel right now will be met by the power of God in the next moment, the next step. He will sustain our hands. But notice what he does here in verse 9. It says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap. There's an old psalm that talks about this in reverse. It says, in due time, 
their foot shall slip. It's speaking of the judgment comes upon those who reap. There'll come a day when people reap the evil they've sown. But this passage reverses it. It's saying that if we give our lives to Christ, oh, this passage is not telling us that we earn or deserve the progress, the results that we see in our lives, in our work, in our family. It's saying they're gifts that we're going to receive in due time, in the special season that God has. Of course, we know that's eternity. But we know that God is so gracious that even those eternal blessings creep and manifest themselves in the everyday world we live in. We've seen it all. We're so thankful for the glimpses of the eternal glory. One of my favorite stories of vision. And what this means is my third point, is that God lifts our eyes beyond the moment to the ultimate. He lifts our eyes to the harvest. And I've always loved this. It's a true story. Walt Disney started building that theme park, right, in Southern California. And, of course, he had a dream to even go to Orlando. Uh, He had this massive empire in his own mind. He worked for years. He passed away, and I think it was at the groundbreaking at, at Orlando. He was gone, and his wife was there at the great honoring moment. And uh, one of the leaders of Walt Disney turned to Walt Disney's wife and said, I just wish Walt was here to see this. And in one of the great moments, she turned and said, he did see it, and that's why it's here. I love that description of how God gives a person a sense of a vision, a sense of an ultimate result that allows that person to work and struggle and even beyond their own lives see things happen. That's what encourages all of us. We won't see every part of the efforts of our lives, but God says, don't, don't despair. Don't be discouraged. There's a harvest coming in the future on earth and the internal new heavens and new earth. We can lift our eyes to the harvest. It's interesting, God took Moses as he was discouraged and even disobeyed God. He was blessing Moses in his discouragement. He took him to the top of the mountain. He made him look into the promised land. Do you remember that? In Deuteronomy, he looks into the promised land. He knew that he wouldn't get there, but he knew God's people would. And he knew ultimately in eternity he would get there. And so he recognizes that God's harvest will cover and overcome these momentary heartaches. And of course, that great image of Moses is is translated into Martin Luther King's life in an eerie, unbelievable speech. You have to read and and see this on YouTube or read about it on Google. You've got to go on. Martin Luther King, just a day or two before he was killed, said, I won't make it to the mountaintop, but that's all right. I won't see all the progress in racial reconciliation in our country, but it's all right. I'm not discouraged, he said, because I've seen, I've seen the glory of God. He uses the imagery of Moses as a preacher, as he was, and describes the fact that he's seen the land where God has done it. And so you and I need to lift our eyes to the harvest and recognize that while we don't have it right here, and while we'll have to step out in the midst of our weariness, God will not only sustain us, but one day he will secure all the dreams and desires that he has for our lives and his world. Along with that, it's interesting Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. There's this also this beautiful sense that God convinces us of the worthwhile nature of our path. Yeah. See, a lot of us are thinking, well, I'm not Martin Luther King. I'm not Moses. I'm not Elijah. I'm just a simple guy working away. I'm a simple woman working away in my office, working on little details and small stuff. This passage says that we will reap eternal life. We'll not only inherit the pleasures that God has, but we'll be a part of the purpose that God's going to accomplish. Everyone who's part of God's kingdom shares in what verse 8 says, reaping of eternal life. That's a very personal thing, but it's a very corporate reality as well. We're going to experience the joys beyond what we could ever imagine here on earth. The fulfillment personally, yes, but also the sense and panoramic purpose that all the world will be made new. And we've, in God's gracious giving way, through the Holy Spirit, participated in that. Wow. Wow. One scholar, and it's hard to find out who this is attributed to it. I heard this years ago, whether it was Burkhoff or John Murray quoting Burkhoff, said this, your studies and your work may be dry as dust. 
But if that dust is gold dust, how worthwhile, how worthwhile is your labor? You see, if we're working in the dustiness of life, but the gospel work in our lives, oh, not just in our what we call spiritual lives, but in our entire lives, which are spiritual, if it's invaded by the gospel presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, whether we work in an office, whether we're on the phone, whether we're Zooming, whether we're going and doing things internationally or right here in our local neighborhood with our family or with large corporations, we are doing something good that will ultimately play a part in eternal life. And so that leads us to the last, the last phrase, the last part. So then, verse 10, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those of the household of faith. It's interesting. So then, as we have an opportunity, there's an indication here that the Spirit not only sustains us, the Spirit not only gives us a vision, but the Spirit is at work in opening up opportunities. How great is that to consider? That as I go through my day, as I step out in the power and the gospel through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is opening doors opening opportunities in all kinds of ways that would truly amaze us if we really, really saw what he was doing. And notice here in this passage how Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is saying to us, we have an attitude of trying to make a huge difference to all people, but especially those who are right here in the household of faith. And so once again, the Bible has this powerful connection between the little and the large. The little things we do every day can make a large difference in the world around us, the local things we do with our families and friends and our church in this community can, can reap benefits that can go far beyond, far beyond. So we recognize that God is giving us this opportunity. Churchill at this talk that he gave, this speech that he gave at the Harrow School, it's interesting, he ended up receiving a hymn the, as was customary in that world, they would write little songs for their schools and they wrote a hymn or an anthem, a song to Winston Churchill. They weren't worshiping him, but they were praising him for being a great leader. And so they wrote in this hymn, this song that was about Winston Churchill that they began to song for him. Can you imagine the English schoolboys in their little outfits singing a song to Winston Churchill? And he thanked them. But in strong and courageous leader, he said, I have to encourage you. I want to challenge you to change the words of the song. Great leaders often do these kinds of things. He said, I want you to change the last verse from, from darker days. He said these words, and I want to read them. He said, these are not dark days. These are the great days. The greatest days our country has ever lived. And we must all thank God that we've been allowed, each of us, to play a part in making these days memorable in history. When I read that this week, it just struck me. We're not living in dark days. We're living in great days, great days of opportunities. Oh, no, no, there's sadness, there's isolation, there's challenge. But therein lies the greatness that we don't have to be discouraged. We serve a God who is greater than all our sin, that is greater than all the brokenness, sin, and viruses of this world. Jesus Christ is the one who has poured out his Holy Spirit and he will sustain and strengthen us and move us into a world where it does appear dark, overwhelming and discouraging, but he will give us the encouragement, the courage to live, to trust and try again in the Holy Spirit. And so I began to think what this means for us as a church. It means that in the Spirit's power, we can pray for our world. In the Spirit's power, we can begin to go out and work, produce all the things we need to live, reflect God's glory, and share with others in need. We can gather online or in safe places to grow in the Lord and give to others the strength they need to make the changes that we all need to make in order to face the challenges that are indeed right before us. We may decide indeed to wear a mask to help our neighbor be safe. And that could be wise. But even more, we may share a message, a message of the gospel that can literally save 
people's lives and welcome them into the purpose and passion of the Holy Spirit where their discouragement would be turned to delight because they know now that this life is not all there is and the life that they live now has a way of echoing into the life that God's going to bring in the new heavens and new earth. And that's going to fill our lives with encouragement, with courage as we trust and try again in the Spirit's power. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your goodness in the midst of this time. These indeed are dark, but oh, great times for us to lean and learn from you. Oh Lord, I pray that you would enable us to take hold of your gospel, to trust and try again, to not be discouraged, but to stand up and step out, not in our own strength, not in our own temerity, not in our own confidence or our own agenda, but to stand and step out, to trust and try again in the gospel in all the various places you put us. And we thank you for all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. My God, wherever I go, glory, where I reap and where I sow, glory, when my hand it grips the thorn, glory, in the still and in the storm, glory. Sun it rises, then goes down, glory. The rain it falls and beats the ground, glory. Dust it blows and ends my days, glory. And hearts they burn beneath your gaze, glory. glory. Heaven and earth are one, oh, we labor unto glory, until God's kingdom comes. My hands, my heart, their kingdom bound, glory, with thorns no more infest the ground, glory, trim the Light the flame, glory. My work it will not be in vain, glory, glory. Oh, we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one. Oh, we labor unto glory until God's kingdom comes. Oh, we labor unto glory. Till heaven and earth are one Oh, we labor unto glory Until God's kingdom come Indeed, take courage. Jesus Christ has overcome the world and provides us with his encouragement and the courage we need to face life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the encouraging fellowship of the Holy Spirit lead and guide you this day and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.